Bitcoin is the one that I think is decentralized enough to call sound money in the sense that there's no one who can change the monetary policy of it. It's kind of designed in such a way. If I guess if you go back for a second for trade-offs, right? So when you, when you build a blockchain, what essentially you're doing is you're making an inefficient database. Um, and it's a database that has the unique capability that it can be stored in anyone's personal device around the world. And that comes with advantages, mainly decentralization. Uh, but it also comes with tons of trade-offs because if you're going to have thousands or millions of people store your database, it has to be tiny. It has to be low bandwidth. And so that's this really small and tight database. And the more you try to add features to that or, or add throughput to that, you're sacrificing some degree of decentralization. Um, and so there's that, there's that trade-off there. So Bitcoin is built like a cockroach in that space. It's basically f- fully optimized for as much decentralization as possible and is willing to sacrifice other variables. And that's what gives it uh, that sound money quality. It, back in 2017 in the block size war, you know, 80% of the hash rate, uh, the largest maker of Bitcoin miners, which, which was almost a, a monopoly, um, the, the largest exchanges and custodians uh, and some of the earlier developers all teamed up and they wanted to change Bitcoin's block size and they couldn't do it. Um, and so it was basically because of that distributed node network, because of that decentralization, it's almost impossible to change without utterly massive consensus to change something. And even then, when it changes, with, for example, this upcoming Taproot um, uh, uh, soft fork, it changes through soft forks you know, rather than hard forks. Uh, and so Bitcoin, in that sense, is something that I consider to be sound money at this point. Whereas when you go into other cryptos, they, I think it's, it's one, on one hand, if they're fully transparent with what they're doing um, and, and they're basically acknowledging the trade-offs that they're making, there's certainly experimentation to be had here. Um, and even, for example, some of the things that started on Ethereum end up going on to, onto Bitcoin DeFi as well. So there, there's innovation in the space. The challenge that we run into in those other projects is that by expanding complexity on the base layer, they sacrifice some degree of, of, of decentralization. And there's a spectrum there. Uh, and so with, say, Ethereum, obviously you, you put smart contracts into the base layer. Um, so one issue is, so you have a lot more uh, features. You can do a lot more with it. You can do DeFi, you can do stable coins, you can do NFTs, uh, whereas Bitcoin can only do that with additional layers put on top of it. So that's a whole different design philosophy. Um, whereas with, with Ethereum, you can do all in the base layer. The downside is, so in order to do all these changes and they, they kind of, their culture is based around changes and, and iteration and improvement. They put, for example, difficulty bombs in the code Uh, And so they change through hard forks rather than soft forks. So it kind of takes away a lot of the power of the nodes. And in addition, the block size grows so much faster than than Bitcoin's does, where in a few years, you're going to need multiple terabytes of data if you want to be able to validate the entire blockchain. Um, And so, and it's also, it's harder to sync it. And then they're going to go to proof of stake and, and, and just, you know, just change that system. And so there's more centralization risk there. And then we get into another project. If you so that that's the kind of the, if you see the bitcoins and the Ethereum's arguing with each other, it's often about decentralization and, and risk and things like that. Then if you get into something like Solana, where you have a proof of stake smart contract chain, it has a lot more throughput than Ethereum, so a lot cheaper fees, um, but it comes with even more centralization. So you often see the Ethereum's criticize Solana for being too too uh, centralized, and they. You know, to, as a, an example of how centralized Solana is, they still do manual slashing. So proof of stake works on slashing, meaning that you know, if if a proof of work miner verifies the wrong blockchain, their punishment is simply that they 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 mine blocks that don't make it into the main chain. Therefore, they wasted real world resources. Um, and that's their own punishment. Whereas in a proof of stake, because you're not using real resources at to validate, you're using your tokens. You have to get your part, some of your tokens taken away if you vote for the wrong chain. Um, and Solana still has manual slashing. So it's not even a fully automated blockchain. The developers still essentially have complete control over it at the end of the day. And we saw, you know, a couple months ago, it went down for 17 hours, the entire blockchain, and had to be like manually, they had to like talk and, and manually restart it at the validators. Um, and so there's a spectrum uh, of decentralization there. And so I put Bitcoin in one bucket and all the others are kind of these experimental tech equities. Um, and so it's, it's two very different types of investments. It's kind of like comparing, you know, uh, like a, a startup company with with no profit yet that's that is kind of getting an idea off the ground versus an established business, right? So it's, it's two very different ways of looking at it. But then another thing I do is that I separate price action from fundamentals. So for example, in my research service, 
I would talk about these issues with Ethereum, but then say, I think for the next year, it's going a lot higher, right? So, and I would talk about some of the supply squeezes that are happening with it. Um, I basically, once it broke over 1400 back in like January or February, that's when I became uh, quite, you know, quite bullish on Ethereum along with Bitcoin in my, in my service and in terms, in terms of price and said, you know, unlike Bitcoin, I don't have a long-term view on this necessarily. I don't know if this is going to be the winner of the smart, smart contract chains. Here's all the centralization risks, but all else being equal, there's a really attractive supply squeeze here. It's probably going higher. And I did the same thing for Solana. So for example, you know, two and a half months ago, I said Solana has a good probability of flipping Cardano. And back then, Cardano was 90 billion market cap, and Solana was 40 billion. Uh, and you know, a couple, uh, you know, less than a week ago, they they did flip, uh, at least at least you know, at least for the moment. Um, and so I, I I separate price action from those fundamentals to some degree, for at least for the coins that I cover, which is generally only say the top 10 coins. Hmm, that's really insightful. Uh, while we're on those other chains, can we just talk about the others? Maybe the ones that are worth talking about. Obviously. You know, you're, we're going to run out of Ethereum co-founders pretty soon, but we've got Hoskinson with Cardano, right? We've got Gavin Woods and Polkadot. They're doing their parachain auctions this last week, so it's becoming more live. Um, I recently had, you know, Silvio McCalli of Algorand, who has another consensus protocol, and I had Edmund Gunansir of AVAX, who has his own consensus protocol. All of them are getting traction in the market. All of them are top 20 market caps. They've got real customers. They've got protocols. Uh, and and then some, but but again, I I do feel like we're we're going to be in the layer one wars in the next year, and I also feel like there's not that many people left, you know, that have a history of understanding a lot of these complex pieces. They could even credibly talk about a, a reasonable new consensus algo or a proof of stake. What what other ones are on your radar, at least for price action for your readers? I mean, the the main ones that I'm I've been covering besides Bitcoin would be Ethereum and Solana. Um, and there's, there's a small number of other ones that I touch on, uh, but those are the those are the two that I've been focusing on in terms of price action. Because my my service is a, is we cover equities, we cover commodities. We're not a crypto service, um, and so I'm not sitting there saying, okay, this this 25th biggest crypto is is attractive. And if anything, because I'm more in that Bitcoin side, I'm basically looking at it and saying a lot of these projects, not every project, but a lot of the projects, they're not being transparent with their trade offs. Uh, I think some of their founders are not even fully aware of the trade-offs that they're making. Like they might get it in the technical sense, but they might not fully understand what made Bitcoin successful. And we generally see a, a pattern where Bitcoin has these bull runs every four years, so or you know roughly four-year cycles. The first one was kind of off. So you had you had 2011, 2013, then you had 2017 in 2021, right? So these kind of four-year cycles, the first the first one was a little bit compressed because it was different. But overall, every, every time Bitcoin has one of these big bull runs, everybody gets into space. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3,000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, $1 million, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke. And you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them. And if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange. And one of the biggest are, for example, Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well-established exchanges. But, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. 
They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof. To the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.